This is Duke University. Good evening, I'm Deborah Jensen, Director of the Franklin Humanities Institute at Duke University. And I'm delighted to welcome you to the inaugural event of our conference, Health, Humanities, and Social Justice, Breath, Body, Voice. We wanted to launch the conference with an event that will channel health and wellness because we will feel it, body and soul. We could not be more thrilled to bring you poet Nikki Finney, a powerful lyrical voice of social justice, poetic justice, in the nation and in the South. And we are proud to host Ms. Finney's performance keynote in so resonant a space as the Hatai Heritage Center, the former AME Church spiritual home of the Hatai District, which was a neighborhood uh, in, of late uh, 19th century Durham, inspired by the Haitian Revolution as a model of civic emancipation. After Nikki Finney's reading, scholar and poet Alexis Pauline Gums will engage Ms. Finney in dialogue and then in Q&A with you. Dr. Gums is a community-cherished poet, scholar, and black feminist love evangelist in Durham with a PhD in English, Africana and Feminist Theory from Duke University. Alexis is the author of Spill, uh, scenes of Black Feminist Fugitivity, and the co-editor of the best-selling anthology Revolutionary Mothering, Love on the Front Lines. Her next book, a Black Feminist post-apocalyptic work of speculative documentary called M Archive, After the End of the World, comes out from Duke Press in February, and I'm sure we'll all be looking for it. This conference is the capstone event of our Mellon Foundation-funded Humanities Futures grant, and it is co-sponsored by the FHI Health Humanities Lab, which is supported by Duke Health Chancellor Eugene Washington and Duke Provost Sally Kornbluth. And now, Duke University Professor of History and next spring's John Hope Franklin Visiting Professor of American Legal History, Thavolia Glimpf, author of such immensely influential books as Out of the House of Bondage, The Transformation of the Plantation Household, will introduce her friend, poet Nikki Finney. So good evening. I want to th first thank Deborah for this opportunity to introduce someone who doesn't need one, but I'm going to do it anyway. And I am uh, a bit nervous, um, and Nikki knows why. Um, one week ago today, <laughs> one week ago this evening, I had the honor of being introduced by Nikki. And after that, I thought, how could I possibly even give my talk, let alone come back to Durham and introduce her? <laughs> I mean, who follows Nikki Finney? But it's OK. Nikki told me, don't worry. So 21 years ago, in 1996, I fell in love with a poet. She had no idea. She did not know me, and I did not know her, either in the way of having personally met her or having ever been in her presence. But I had read Rice, and this much I knew, that Nikki Finney was a woman born of the same soil as me, that she was a woman who spoke to what it meant, what, to what that meant, in ways that I deeply recognized but I could never imagine speak a right in language as powerful or beautiful as hers. But because I recognized her, I believed I knew her, and that is proven to be true. But at that moment, I simply held the book Rice in my hands and devoured its words, watching the alphabets dancing in her head. In my mind, I could see her in the act of 
pencil frying sweet black alphabets in an all-night oil. A few years later, in 1999, three years to be exact, I prevailed on a friend who taught at the University of Kentucky to ask this woman for whom alphabets danced and who could make them dance if she would sign a copy of Rice for Me. This was for me an odd and unprecedented thing to do, and I've never done it again. Soon thereafter, I was in possession of this. The inscription dated September 26, 1996, read, quote, for the Valier Glimp, in honor of South Carolina days, in honor of peppermint words, walk good, Nikki Finney. Good Lord, I danced, and I have been trying ever since to walk good and to honor peppermint words. Most times, the bios we recite and introduce in a speaker tell us nothing about where she came from. And we have grown accustomed to thinking this does not matter. But Nikki Finney's poetry does not allow this conceit. Born in Conway, South Carolina, overlooking the Waccamaw River at the foot of the Atlantic Ocean. She was born in a place with a history that resides forever in her body and in her work. A few days ago, as I was driving back from South Carolina, as Hurricane Irma was tearing up, churning up the ocean, land, and habitation, uprooting lives and destroying livelihoods, Nikki Finney's poem, God Ain't Making No More Land, came to mind. A poem in requiem to the land, lives, and cultures destroyed when men built highways and golf courts Gulf resorts pressed the land, but nature, she reminded us, always proved, quote, whose hips is widest. This is what she does. This is who she is. Her achievements are too many to recite in the time I have, and no doubt more than she would want recited in an introduction. But I am bound by something larger than the dictates of this formality to name some of these achievements. Professor fin Finney is a proud graduate of Talladega College. At the University of Kentucky, where she taught for 21 years, she was the inaugural Guy Davenport Endowed Professor. Today, she is the John H. Bennett Chair in Creative Writing and Southern Letters at the University of South Carolina. She is the acclaimed author of four books of poetry on wings made of gauze, rice, the award-winning The World is Round, and Heads Off, Head Off and Split, which won the 2011 National Book Award for Poetry, one of the most prestigious prizes in American letters. She is a coveted speaker at events large and small, here in this country and abroad. And all are occasions for her to teach, for classrooms to form. She writes purposefully of love joy, and family. She writes when she is called to by events that trouble her soul. She writes because she has no choice. She was born for this. Take, for example, her poem, The Battle of and for the Black Faced Boy, the first full-length poem to be published in Oxford, America. A poem she had begun writing when the deaths of Trayvon Martin and Michael Brown intruded, as she wrote, and that poem, originally scheduled to be uh, to commemorate the sesquicentennial of the Civil War, became a radical libretto, libretto. Then there's the beautiful, beautiful poem, Topless in America, in honor of, pa of Paulette Leopard, which gives new meaning to Jeff Davis Highway. Tonight, we welcome a daughter of South Carolina the daughter of a trailblazing lawyer who defended thousands of civil rights workers and became the first Chief Justice of the South Carolina Supreme Court, the first African American appointed to the court since Reconstruction, the daughter of a mother who could not prevent the disfiguring of the public spaces her children walked, but who ensured that there would be beauty in their segregated lives, a mother who, like mine, is a Newberry girl. 
We welcome a poet farmer, an activist in her own right and in her own shoes. The poet whose acceptance speech for the 2011 National Book Award for Poetry became a national global phenomena. Who standing there before that audience and the world made sure that they would see the soil from which she came, the people whose names had been blocked from view. Nikki Finney is the promise of the ancestors. The promise of the ancestors forbidden by law to learn to read and write, to hold a pencil or a book, forbidden to move their pelvises however and whenever they chose. She is the flame keeper of their dreams, the people's poet some have called her, she the relentless pursuer of truth. Please join me in welcoming to the community of Duke and Durham a woman who has been contemplative her entire life, who was always with pencils and books, a woman who gave up little lace dresses for the freedom of movement, a poet whose southern black woman ways and humanity inspires and gives us a place to lean and rest and grow. I am privileged to call Nikki Finney a colleague, a friend, and a sister. Kwame Dawes has called her one of the most eloquent, urgent, fearless, and necessary poets writing in America today. And that, my friends, has made walking good easier for all of us. Nikki Finney. my dress for you tonight. Doesn't happen often. Um, I am so honored to be asked to begin this amazing weekend and this conver these conversations that will happen, these collaborations, hopefully, because that's why we come together, I think, in, in the name of breath, body, and voice. I can't even begin to talk about the Volia Glimpse and my four-page introduction of her last week, her four-page introduction of me this week. It's a love fest. I don't know what else to say. Um, and you know, you know, black girls grow up, I won't talk about this long, but black girls grow up in a world that teaches them not to love each other for a lot of reasons. But um, at this moment in my life, uh, and way, way long before, I'm just so, I mean, if I could, I would sit up here and read to you out of the Volia Glimpse book. It's well marked. Um, I had it on the airplane today, and I told her that I like to read it on the airplane because I've got my seatbelt on. I can't harm anybody. Um, but everything she teaches me, that nobody else has the audacity to teach me. I read over and over and over again, and it seeps into my work, and I'm just so grateful for you and for your work. So thank you. So, um, I, I didn't really know what I wanted to do until uh, last week after thinking about it. I wanted to be a part of this conversation, not just the beginning event. And so this is how this is going to roll. I hope it's OK with you. I'm going to give you some answers to some questions that you're going to have as I read what I brought to read to you. I'm going to give them to you up front so that you don't have any problem following me, OK? So it's, here's the list. I said I was a farmer in the narrator, narration, right? I know you wondered, is she really a farmer? What is she talking about? OK, both sides of my family were farmers. My mother grew up in South Carolina, my father in Virginia. And my grandparents were the turning point where the children did not go back to the farm. But I grew up on those farms in the summertime. And with great intention, I always wanted to be a writer who got up before the sun 
and put something in the ground that might grow. That's why I say poet hyphen farmer. And also, if you look up the word farmer, you will find that a farmer is a person who improves or promotes the growth of a plant. You are the plant that I am trying to improve upon. We are the plant, humanity, human beings. That's how I see that as a poet. Um, this talk that I'm going to give you is called Sipping Kerosene at the Refactory. I know you rolled your eyes at that one. Or Ain't You Got a Right to the Tree of Life. And I grew up in a state where Ain't You Got a Right to the Tree of Life was a song that was sung in churches uh, on the Sea Islands especially. Um, and it was a song that I used to hum as a little girl growing up in South Carolina. Sipping Kerosene at the Refactory. Well, my grandmother made us when we spent the summers with her, if she had any hint that we were getting sick, she made us gargle with kerosene. And we had to spit it out. And there was an art to this. And by the time we spat it out, I was a little heady because I have kerosene in my body. And so as a poet, I always wanted to write something about what would happen if I was sipping kerosene, spitting it out, in the act of staying healthy, but also in the act of remembering something my grandmother taught me to do um, for my wholeness. I know that's a lot, but stay with me, as the Baptist preacher would say. Fannie Lou Hamer's name you will hear, Majeska Simpkins, Septima Clark, Ella Baker, Robert Smalls. If you don't know who those people are, you should probably leave right now. But if you don't want to leave, just kind of hang around him for the Q&A, and we can talk about him them, Benjamin Banneker, John Hope Franklin, I know you know the prince of history, um, Benjamin Banneker, obsessed with his almanacs, Althea Gibson, and then Stephen George Morrison, who was a young white progressive lawyer in South Carolina who said things to the power structure in South Carolina that most young white attorneys in South Carolina never spoke um, to those power structures, and he wrote volumes about civil rights and other progressive things. And he died a month before I moved back to South Carolina. And as soon as I moved back, his name kept coming to me in, by way of other people. And so you'll hear his name mentioned at the end. Um, the refectory, the, my college, Talladega College in Talladega, Alabama, didn't say Talladega College Dining Hall. It said Talladega College Refectory. And I thought this was, I was so curious about this. And I would ask my friend, I was like, why, why do they call it that? And nobody knew. They was like, oh, it's just a dining hall. And so, of course, I had to go look it up because I was a young poet. And you poets look up words. And so I discovered that this was a very particular place where human beings went for nourishment. And sometimes it was um, a religious place. And sometimes it was an academic place. And I love the specificity of that. In the refectory of Talladega College, there was one seat where I would always sit, and I could look out the window across the campus and across Alabama almost, and I, in my own poet's eye, could see the horizon. That's why this is in this piece as well. And then you will hear the last two or three names. Strom Thurmond, I know you know. Brooklyn Mack um, is a professional American ballet dancer from Elgin, South Carolina, who has won gold medals all across the world. And he said this amazing thing that you will find in the talk I'm about to give. And he said, ballet is more challenging than football. Um, you will also um, hear me read something from the magazine that took me across for about 10 years, a magazine called Double Take. And I know many of you know Double Take Magazine. It was at one point associated with Duke University. But Double Take was a magazine, if you don't know it, I have every single copy that was ever published, and saved them and now have them hermetically sealed and in plastic. Because this was a magazine that weighed ph images, photography, as, with as much weight as it, as it gave words. And they allowed writers and photographers and artists to wander through their work and to see. And it was just this pristine, beautiful publication. And it lasted about 15 or 18 years. And then it, it ran out of money. But it was one of the most important publications that was ever done in America, as far as, as I 
am concerned. And there was a poem that was published at the beginning of that publication that is also in this talk. Um, and then there's Tony K. Bambara, and you will hear me mention the book of Bambara. And I am a, I never had the privilege of taking a creative writing class, but I was always mentored, maybe because I was always bothering and hanging around and looking for black women writers in the world. And I was in her writing workshop for about two years, and she taught me so much um, about being the writer that I wanted to be. Um, and she was a great believer in the revolution. So this is what I have for you. Sipping kerosene at the refectory, or ain't you got a right to the tree of life? And there's an epigraph. One must be of one's time and paint what one sees. Edouard Manet, artist. Being fully of my time, and shortly after winning the Elizabeth O'Neill Verner Award for the Arts in South Carolina, I took to sipping kerosene at the refectory in quiet celebration. While doing so, I decided it was time to go really big, for the second half of my life was upon me. After moving back home to South Carolina in 2013 and finding all the evidence still in place from when I left at 17, that not much had changed, and that improvement in the quality of life for some still did not mean improvement in the quality of life for all, I decided that historian Barbara J. Fields was absolutely right. There was still time, and the Civil War could still be lost. Fields wrote, if some citizens live in houses and others live on the street, the Civil War is still going on, end quote. Kerosene on ice will be my elixir. I must do more than I've been doing. For some reason, people like to see me as only one thing, poet. They have no idea that I've been painting since I was 12. So it is necessary, really, to talk up my new idea of a major art project in downtown Columbia. I decided to use the fact that I've won the National Book Award as clout. I'll make it work. So I am commissioned by the state of South Carolina to paint a large mural directly on the facade of the Strom Thurmond Wellness and Fitness Center, right in the center of the USC campus. Right between all the pretty sparkling glass and high circular cathedral-like dome. Yes, how dare they name a health and wellness center after someone who was the poster boy for hatred and racism by day and the father of a secret black daughter by night. I'm hoping to channel Diego Rivera or Hale Woodruff, maybe even Elizabeth Catlett, if I can keep my focus tight. I find murals infinitely powerful, and because this is a sweet, dangerous time for me, I'm 59, I've decided to turn from poetry to painting. There are images that need to be seen without the possible intrusion of mixed metaphor. The contact person from the governor's office has good news about the mural project. She whispers her state secret over the phone on the down low. The governor wants you to know that he knows you have been upset about his refusal to relinquish his lifetime membership in the last all-white country club that exists in South Carolina, but he has decided to give you a green light on the mural project. Because he says more and more everyday people wanting to move to South Carolina are calling in and asking questions about quality of life. Quality of life. She says quality of life three times. And since he's not running for re-election, she adds, he'll take a chance that your mural has something to do with quality of life. But he says he cannot get you a parking pass. <laughs> As I sip and spit out the grade A kerosene, I say to myself, my mural has all and everything to do with quality of life. A friend calls to tell me that a black woman is getting ready to walk a thousand miles from Mississippi to Washington, D.C., topless. Topless. She is third generation breast cancer warrior. When I see a photo of her, I, I wonder if I'm dreaming. I am not. She really does not have a top on, and she's a woman, not a girl, a mother of eight. And she's standing in the light of the sun with the ocean at her back, talking about what she is about to do. 
On her website, there are images of people stopping to embrace her, men, policemen, mothers, children. She is a woman on a mission and not a girl playing in the sun. And did I say she's topless? She's topless because she's breastless. Both breasts cut away, radical mastectomy, and even more radical scar now moves across her chest and lungs like the tail of a baby alligator. What remains is a sexy woman. The way she holds her shoulders back as she sits and explains as if everything she needs is still all there. I, I'm not dreaming. Everything she needs is still all there. She makes her announcement about her walk across the country at the beach in Biloxi. The ocean waves behind her move in silent applause. Women on the beach are coming up to her one by one to let her know she is the most beautiful woman they have ever seen. Later, other women write to her online to say, good luck and all that. But they add they would rather be dead and with their Lord and Savior than alive without their breasts. Because I am as clear as a blue cloudless sky, I know that art heals. I decide the walking woman will be one of the main inspirations for my mural. Just like her, I know that scars can tell a story if you pull them out into the sun and take them for a walk uncovered. Being an artist of my time, I know that time is precious, and therefore I rise before the sun and pack my old Ford truck that was once my grandfather's with everything I need to do on the mural for the next few months in the back bed that used to haul bales of alfalfa and wheat and hogs that I had carefully chosen names for before they went to market. I show the University of South Carolina security guards who meet me, who are both brothers, my beautiful award from the state of South Carolina. It's wrapped in swaddling clothing and teetering on the puckered leather seat beside me. They are so impressed. The oldest one says he went to school with my brother, so they finally agree to help me get in and out of the gate every day without an official pass. I tell them that I don't want them to get fired, but the younger one, the one with baby dreads just starting to pop in, he says people with the biggest sets of keys need to help artists. He is so cute when he says this. He is more than right. This morning, my buckets of paint are lined up against the south wall of the Strom Thurmond Wellness and Fitness Center. Last night in the backyard beneath the moon on both side doors of my truck, I painted this. Ain't you got a right to the tree of life? The script is in bold Helvetica and lathered deeply in both fuchsia and cardamom orange. I have paint brushes of all sizes and shape stuck face up in my back overall pockets. In the bed of my old rattling Ford truck, I have ladders of all sizes, short, long ropes, wooden pulleys of different sizes. I have paintbrushes with Majeska Simpkins, John Hope Franklin, and Ella Baker's face etched into the handles. They are stuck there according to size. I have Septima Clark ladders that can reach into any dark and shady corner, and I have a very special limited edition Robert Smalls number 10 set carabiner with matching repelling gear, just in case some unknown passerby doesn't like the art I'm creating and tries to knock the ladder out from under me while I'm working. I think I've thought of everything. I turned to the huge, empty, sandy-colored south wall, climbed and began to outline and sketch. My theme is taken straight from the book of Bambara. Her most magnificent question found in her novel, The Salt Eaters. Quote, are you sure, sweetheart, that you want to be well? Just so you sure, sweetheart, and ready to be healed, because wholeness is no trifling matter, end quote. Whether the more and more of hurricanes, including the thousand year flood that hit us last October is on my mind and heart. Floods have a way of dousing our differences and bringing us closer. Even when we are soaking wet, they remind me of Zora Neale and are quite every day and biblical too. So I decide to make waves and water the major symbols hidden in the work. Exactly where and precisely how the dams broke, where the earth gave way without warning, how people helped each other without thinking how much what the other looked like or what they were wearing or how different their hair was and as the water got higher, all of this has really stayed with me. The screaming man with gray hair that I saw holding onto the tree trunk in waist high water and the kind man with blonde hair walking ever toward him by holding onto tree limb after tree limb to get to him. The kind man's son who was back in the truck 
standing on the hood telling the screaming stranger to not let go. And later on the news, the woman with braids being saved in her apartment by the man who religiously attends Civil War reenactments once a year. There's a lot water could teach us if we let it. As I paint the water into the entire background, I wonder how did the walking woman from Mississippi tell her daughter she was going topless across the country just before she walked outside and went topless? Did the girls cry or cheer for her? Was water, were waves present? Did they drench them all? The girls are of the age when their own breasts are just waking up. I've long believed if girls and women were allowed to walk with their breasts open and out in the sun like boys and men, we could have different conversations about our bodies. Conversations from violence perpetuated in the name of love to stand by your man reruns. But I'll save all that for mural number two. The days of the thousand year flood have me thinking in teal blue and coral. Maybe I'll add a little steel gray. I'll need the hundred foot Septima Clark metal ladder securely beneath me before I'm through it all. The mural will be mostly watercolors but non-traditional, vibrant primary oil paints, along with gold and silver and black etching powder will also be used to help a poet's story make its point. I've chosen the Falalopsis John Hope Franklin orchid, and the Falalopsis are really a Franklin orchid as the official flowers of the mural. They're royal red and white and egg yolk yellow and crimson faces will bloom from behind everything else. By mid-morning, I'm up stretching out and over the edge of the tallest ladder I have, I need to work hard at filling in the delicate backgrounds in order to pull something disparate all together. Being of my time, I moved to a new image of a black man with a broken taillight being stopped by a policeman and asked to get out of his car. He steps out but suddenly takes off running and three seconds later he's shot in the back with eight rounds of bullet. There is a younger black man outside the fence catching it all on his cell phone in absolute disbelief. As he follows the bullets, his voice enter the frame in my high wall. He can't believe what he's seeing. I pause my brush midair to decide if I should keep the young man in the frame or not. Is he artistic enough to be up on the wall or is he obsolete? Is being a young black man alive and not the one running or faced out obsolete to the story? Then I watch the policeman drop something near the not now moving man's body. I decide I have to include the young man whose camera in hand never flinched no matter how shocked he was about what he was watching. I choose bright eggplant purple with silver edges for a natural emphasis to, to avoid the implausible and forego anything that might appear supernatural or surreal. Even though I am an artist of my time, and this is the time, though not the only time, when black people were shot down every day in America, I will not become numb to this history of mass murder. The water keeps pouring from my eyes as I paint. I think of the book of Bambara. I ask myself if I want to be well. I whisper as I work, yes, yes. I know a new moon is coming. I finish the sketch. I move to the next image. If my grandmother was here, she would tell me to go inside, go outside and plant something. I believe that paint can have the properties of dirt. In the upper right-hand corner of the south wall, a young black woman with long braids is climbing a flagpole at the historic Confederate monument on the State House grounds in Columbia. It's early morning, summertime. She climbs just like she practiced in the days leading up to her great climbing moment. I choose a small, delicate brush with long bristles to paint her climbing head, bowed legs, and work hard to get her spine the right size. I close my eyes to imagine how I might steady her every move up the pole. The 20th century Charleston painter Elizabeth Verner, who painted black women of the street market, comes to mind. I imagine the young woman moving up the pole carrying 40 pounds of sweet violets and knockout roses balanced perfectly on her head. It works. The young woman is whispering to the early palmetto sky that she is tired of this old hatred blowing in the wind in South Carolina, tired of waiting for the slow legislature to give up and give an up or down vote. Her legs are strong. She believes in Jesus. And as a girl, she overheard the news that Jesus was a radical, so she imitates the legs of the radical she climbs. There is a very nice state trooper below her who is asking her very nicely to come down and not do what she is about to do. He tells her that she is breaking the law. 
But the young woman climber with Jesus in her heart is out of his reach and she is whispering what she has learned in her young life that sometimes laws are wrong and sometimes someone has to address the wrong. The young woman is also very nicely whispering back to the very nice state trooper as she climbs, yes sir, I will come down just as soon as I get that flag. Everybody is nice in doing what they believe they need to do in the early summer morning light of day. How tall can I draw this young woman's heart? I don't want abstraction. I will color it persimmon with a little melon. I wonder should the state trooper be in the picture too? Is he obsolete or part of the action? Baldwin said artists have to make 40,000 decisions with every project. Before he arrests her, he extends his arms like a gentleman and helps her over the iron pointy fence. I have to keep him in. Another decision looms. Our very own gorgeous principal world gold medal ballerina from Elgin, South Carolina, Brooklyn Mack will stand majestically in the middle of the wall of the Strom Thurmond Health and Fitness Center. The orchids will surround him on all sides. The way this young man holds his head, even when he is not dancing, could light the heavens. The straight loblolly pine of his back, his giving up football for ballet, his blue chocolate heavenly skin color, he definitely should be the center of this centerpiece. I will paint his beautiful body, black body, in pearl white tights. Strom Thurmond will turn over in his grave. <laughs> I will elongate his arms up and turn them in a half bow. I will make his legs as muscular as they are and arch them in ballet position number two. I will make this young gorgeous black man 20 feet tall and he will stop traffic there at the corner of assembly and blossom. And the football revelers who will want to piss on him when they see him won't be able to get it up this high. <laughs> Just above his head, I will write this. Ballet is more challenging than football. <laughs> I'll need to climb back down and use a paint that cannot be defiled by paintball guns or beer rockets. All that the frat boys seem to prefer when they are good and drunk and wishing old times were not forgotten. I will mix up a special, special batch of clear coat, a see-through gaze as strong as plastic and specially made of low country cotton root and anise bark. It will make his beautiful black skin indelible because black skin is. Being an artist of my time, I can't stop thinking about Paulette Leapheart, the black woman walking from Mississippi to Washington, DC, and all the people that will be staring and whispering that she didn't have to go so far as to remove her clothes. They will question her motives, and it makes me remember what Dr. Maya Angelou said about modesty. You know what she said? She said, modesty is a lie. The walking woman is trying to tell us how scars tell the truth, nothing but the truth, the whole truth, but the world we live in doesn't spend enough time talking about how an abundance of breath in the body gives voice to the body. I've saved the upper left-hand corner of the wall for a dry point sketch of a black girl staring into her cell phone at her desk. She's in her high school classroom. She's disobeying the teacher, and she does not look up from her phone, even though she has been asked to several times. What color should the background be when the safety officer gives up treating her like a teenager in trouble, a foster kid, and puts her in a convict chokehold? Then dumps her from the chair onto the concrete floor. Should the color change from blue jay blue to prison guard gray when he throws her against the wall? Or should it remain the same when he arrests her for disrupting the class? What about her friend? another black girl who speaks up for her across the room. Maybe this scene is too big for one panel or two colors. Maybe this should be a triptych. The young woman's friend on the other side of the room is told by the security officer, do you want some of this too? She is arrested with her and made an example of before her classmates. This young woman is just like the young man in the park. She is the witness whom the society wants to eliminate. She is in shock and disbelief at what she has just seen in her classroom. Whose health is at risk in this moment? Whose quality of life do we care most about? Here at the bottom of the wall, just above the line of pink azaleas, I'm thinking I'd like to see the haunting 19th century verse of Dave the Potter. I refuse to call him Dave the Slave like others because one is not born a slave. One is forced to be a slave. Language is particular for a reason. I want to quote what he wrote on, this, on his 40-gallon pot. He said, 
I wonder where is all my relations, boldly dreaming aloud for, po for posting for posterity's sake, the question any thoughtful, loving human would wonder, where might his separated, decimated, split in 20 different directions family be in the world? I wonder if the people who thought they owned him ever answered him, or did they just haul away his 40-gallon glazed pots and bring him more piles of that good red Edgefield dirt to make more masterpieces? I've calculated all night that I can get all seven of his words right in this corner and still paint every letter he wrote five feet high in sunny canary neon yellow. Being of my time and consumed with the quality of life, I decide the mural would be incomplete without including the entire edifice of Charleston's Mother Emanuel right here in the two o'clock space. I am thinking of Elizabeth Verner's beautiful St. Philip's in the rain. I am thinking I will call my rendering Mother Emanuel another weeping time. I've decided to etch each of the faces of the nine believers into the windows in the manner of stained glass, but what colors depict a circle of human beings so perfectly willing to welcome a young stranger, and he so perfectly willing to murder them with Bibles in their hands, with his Confederate issued handgun poised and tapping against his white supremacist loving heart as he asked each of them that he had not shot yet this question. Have I shot you yet? Should I choose mauve or crimson, a tepid cornflower blue? Does he even get to be included? Should his question grace this wall at all? Or what about my question to him? If some murderers go straight to jail, and other murderers are taken to Burger King for one last whopper with cheese before they go, is the Civil War still going on? I don't know where I'll put him, but I must leave some primary space for the quiet, courageous judge from Pickens County, a man known for his wicked shrimp gumbo and coca van, who wrote the trailblazing two-to-one decision in the Fourth Circuit Federal Court in favor of gay marriage. I decide to paint his backbone the same size as the black woman walking from Mississippi to Washington. His eloquent, pioneering words will occupy the entire side panel that faces away across the trees precisely untoward the new law school being built. I've measured carefully, and each of the following letters can be three feet, seven inches tall. He said, we recognize that same-sex marriage makes some people deeply uncomfortable. However, inertia and apprehension are not legitimate bases for denying same-sex couples due process and equal protection of the laws. What color can I use to highlight his brilliant and judicious use of the word inertia? Periwinkle? That's too predictable. I'm thinking more rose quartz or Keeneland green, especially for applicate, apprehension. Some subtle shade of indigo might help it appear to be surrounded in moonlight. Peridot, cobalt. Two months pass, I'm almost finished. The weather has cooperated for the most part. People who pass by on their way to and from work and school wave to me now and then sometimes. I become more than a pain in the side of the status quo. I become a dedicated fixture of their imaginations. Others that pass, drop off suggestions for what they would like to see up on the great wall of another mural. They tuck pieces of paper just under the windshield wiper of my truck. There were nine pieces of paper stuck there yesterday. One lady in a yellow beach hat suggested I include in my mural the faces of the City Council of Columbia. They tried to criminalize homelessness. It doesn't matter, she said, that they rescinded their unanimous vote. She yells it up to me, trying to make her point. I'm on the ladder. I keep nodding my head and keep painting. She's screaming at me now. Whatever happened to there but for the grace of God go I, or ain't you got a right to the tree of life? I look down and nod my head in agreement. I wave and tell her she's right about how much space we give the evil forces in our daily lives and how, and how, much, how, how little space we give the good. Another young man with long black hair stops, me on, stops by on his motorcycle. Hey, lady, 
I got something for you to consider, he says. Who are you, I say. It doesn't matter who I am, he replies. I've already sent it to the tourist board, but I haven't heard back yet. What did you send, I ask as I keep painting, trying with all my might to stay on schedule. This is what I sent. In South Carolina, there are more tax incentives for guns than for family farmland. I stop painting. Is that true? Or are you exaggerating? I want to know, I tell him. All the gun manufacturers left Connecticut and New York and came here by invitation. They pay no taxes and were given free office space at the beach. Is that true? I ask, stopping my brush midair and looking down off the ladder. The truth hurts, he says, pulling off with a good wheelie. I want to stop and Google what he just said, but I'm on deadline. Because I am of my time, just before any finishing touches happen, I stand back and stare at the last empty space on the wall, right there atop the elongated, perfect for pirouetting arms of our great gold medal Elgin ballerina, right at high noon, I've saved 50 feet of latitude and longitude for the face of the godfather of soul, James Brown. He has finally risen from his sister's front yard mausoleum and is back holding a microphone wanting to know why a man that was the attorney general, now governor, who has master in his last name, has tried for 10 years to disregard his last will and testament. Why a lawyer with lady parts from Newberry, one of the only ones trying to get the money he legally left for all the poor children of South Carolina and Georgia, to the poor children of Georgia and South Carolina. Why was she abruptly taken off the case by the good old boys? Why 10 years after his death, not a dime has gone to the children who no one in the future will ever leave a dime to. James Brown says, I was their last chance. This is what he sings into the microphone as his shoulders spin in a gold fur cape just above the gold medal ballerina's arms. I was their very last chance. The mouths of his backup singers are arched in unison all the way across the gold dome of the Capitol to the marble steps of the Supreme Court. They are all in perfect sync as they sing out in root beer brown and turquoise. How can you steal money from children who have no money and still call yourself the governor and still look at yourself in the mirror every day and still live with yourself? Practice, I say. They've had practice. A tall man wearing a suit walks up to my ladder just as I am climbing down to break camp, roll up the ladders and ropes, put everything back in my truck, wash off my hands, and drive away from the finally finished Ain't You Got a Right to the Tree of Life mural project. He looks one half poet and one half appeals court lawyer, the closest thing in law school that you can get to being a poet. He reaches up where I'm standing on the second to the last rung on the Althea Gibson ladder and extends to me his business card. The card reads, Stephen George Morrison. We just missed each other, he says to me with shy, empathetic eyes. We never got to meet when we were both alive. I checked out the same month you moved back home, he says. I stare at him as if I know him from another time, and then it hits me. I hadn't been in town a month before someone sent me something he wrote about something I wrote along with his obituary, which when I sat and read it, revealed the life of a giant of a man who cared about kids and people and the system that often forgot those kids and people. On the back of the card, there was something written in his delicate librarian-like handwriting. Human beings suffer, it said. They torture one another. They get hurt and get hard. No poem or play or song can fully right a wrong inflicted and endured. The innocent gowls beat on their bars together. A hunger striker's father stands in the graveyard dumb. The police widow in veils faints at the funeral home. History says, don't hope on this side of the grave. But then, once in a lifetime, the long for a tidal wave of justice can rise up and hope and history rhyme. So hope for a great sea change on the far side of revenge. Believe that a further shore is reachable from here. Believe in miracles and cures and healing wells. 
call miracle self-healing, the utter self-revealing, double take of feeling. If there's fire on the mountain or lightning and storm and a God speaks from the sky, that means someone is hearing the outcry and the birth cry of new life at its term. Seamus Heaney, The Cure at Troy. I finish reading the poem aloud, a poem that I have loved and used to know by heart. I know it's a lot, Morrison says, but I was just wondering, just if you had any room left. He asked me this with his right hand up near his eyes, blocking out the sun as if he doesn't want to ask too much of me. That's when a topless, breastless black woman walks right by. Her daughter is having a hard time keeping up with her Land Rover legs. She waves to me, blows me a kiss, and says with her hands on her hips, ain't I got a right to the tree of life, honey? She doesn't seem to have time to stop and chat. She's not a girl playing on the beach in the sun. She's a woman on a mission with her shirt off. I wave and tell her she reminds me of Zora with a hurricane at her back. I look back down at the lawyer who left and came back to help me get it right. I'll make some room, I tell him, because wholeness is no trifling matter. He turns and goes his way, tipping his hat in that southern gentleman way he can't help. And I start the climb back up my Althea Gibson ladder to add this one last thing. Thank you. Does anybody need three deep breaths? <laughs> I do, so I'll just model. Inhaling, exhaling loud. <sighs> and inhaling, and exhaling. <sighs> One more time, inhaling, and exhaling. <sighs> All right. We're in sacred space. So I was going to tell you a story about how Nikki Finney, who has been giving me, you know what, improving my quality of life since I was a teenager and we met at Karis Bookstore, the oldest feminist bookstore in North America, which is in Atlanta, Georgia. And she did what you do for so many people, for so many poets, for so many young women. You just said, yes. Yes, do your thing. But then something happened this evening, so I have to tell you that story. It's an even better story. So today would have been and is the 100th birthday of my grandmother, Lydia Gums. And so today, everything I'm wearing is from somebody who loves Lydia Gums. So this is her necklace that I wear every day. This is her sister's dress, her other sister's ring, earrings. This is my mother's. These are my sister's. And since modesty is a lie, my other grandmother who loves grandma even sent me the underwear I'm wearing right now. <laughs> Thank you, Grandma. <laughs> Does other, do other people's grandmothers do that? I don't know. My grandmother does that. And my grandmother, Lydia, designed the revolutionary flag of a small country called Anguilla, which is a small country. So everybody in that country is my relative. And you may know that we are dealing with this massive, destructive, hurricane and, um, and are flooded and, and are homeless at this moment. So I've been channeling my grandmother. The flag is blue and white and orange, really a coral color. But when I got here, I wasn't wearing anything orange. Nikki gave me this scarf just now. 
So happy birthday, Grandma. <laughs> and without knowing, without knowing anything about the flag of Anguilla. Um, so this is what happens when you trust your breathing and you trust your intuition. Like, this is what's possible. And so I wanted to say thank you in front of my community for showing me what a community accountable artist looks like, what a community accountable artist does, and for saying yes. And one more story. Because there was a time I had gone to college and I had put words by Nikki Finney. I don't know if they even have got them off yet. I put them, I put packing tape all over my walls and then I drew in brown Sharpie quotations from your poetry. And I was coming home to Atlanta. You were doing a reading in Atlanta for The World is Round and I missed the reading, but you left the book and you signed it to Alexis, the poet, exclamation point, the publisher, exclamation point, keep doing the possible, exclamation point. And so I want to say that to be in this sacred space and to be in this community with you has to do with mentorship. It has to do with the intergenerational scale of breathing. And so I wanted to start our conversation invoking a mentor of yours, who you have already mentioned, Tony Cade Bambara. And you wrote a poem for Tony Cade Bambara as she was at the end of her life in response to your letter you had written. Is there anything that I can do for you? Is there anything that you need? And she had said, would you send some paper? And you wrote this poem. If you all haven't read this poem, The Making of Paper, that poem. And so I'm thinking about trees and paper and breathing and the end of breathing that is not always the end of breathing in this intergenerational scale. So I wanted to read you a poem that I wrote for the occasion of Tony K. Bambara's 75th birthday and the Feminist Wire's celebration of her birthday. But I also wrote it, I didn't tell anybody this, but I wrote it as my father was in his last bed. And it's called A Spell to Save Your Life. After Tony Cade Bambara. One, eat salt. Not that ocean drowning snack to stop thinking about dying unintentional salt. Eat salt on purpose. Salt conductor of dreams, ancestor crystal portal, blood water preservation, clean it out with your eyes. Two, deep sight. Practice living in the dark and seeing what the light don't want you to see. Go on a mission to rescue the part of the universe that will always be you, black and unknowable. Three, be well. Want to be well deep enough to drink from. Be bell ringing soul alarms. Be Buried mineral breakthrough, solid, fluid, charmed. Four, see birds, love gorillas, listen to dolphins, and do not swallow what you know. Breathe it out the top of your head, knock on your chest until you hear it. Remember how to fly. So with that, I just wanted to ask you, I only have two questions for you, because everybody else I know has questions. But I wanted to ask if you could talk a little bit about Tony Cade Bambara and what she taught you about wellness. Now hearing your talk, I'm thinking about her short story, The Wall. But anything you want to say about Tony Cade Bambara is perfect. So I just I have one really, really critical story to share with you. I, Tony K. Bambara started a gathering at her house. She started at Spelman College, but kind of got kicked off Spelman College's campus because it wasn't academic enough. 
And we met once a month at this small house on the top of a hill in, in northeast Atlanta. And we would sit around and we would read each other's work and we would critique what we heard. You know, there were nurses, bus drivers, students, people who just love language. It wasn't a set academic scene. And this was, this was so important for me because I went to colleges that didn't have creative writing courses. They had great teachers, but they had English courses and history courses. And I, you know, I just never got to take a creative writing course. Um, but I had, but, I ne but it wasn't that I ever thought I couldn't write because I had been around people who had always told me, you can write, what you waiting on, write. So I'm in this Tony K. Bambara circle. We're leaving one day, we spend from, we go at noon, we leave around six or seven. We're with Tony K. Bambara. She didn't have to host us. She's one of the most amazing short story writers in the world, but she does. And we're leaving, we're going, I'm walking her to the bus stop. And the bus driver gets off the bus. There are four of us just walking and talking. And he walks up to Tony Cade and he says, are you that writer woman? And I'm like, oh, he wants an autograph. Da, 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 in my own kind of twisted Western thinking for the moment of a 22 year old. And she goes, yeah, I'm that writer woman. And he goes, well, and he takes these papers out of his pocket. They're, bought, they're all folded. And he says, my wife and I are trying to buy a house. I don't write so well. Actually, I don't read so well. Can you help me? My first response is, she can't help you. This is Tony K. Mamora. <laughs> <laughs> you got to go up to the community college and get some help. Come on, brother, this is like not cool. I'm protective of her, right? It's my mentor. She goes, of course. Come by the house on Saturday, 4 o'clock. I'll help you. I never forgot that. That 30 seconds went against 20 years of Western teaching about who a writer is in the community. If you say you are a writer, then write all kinds of things. Don't just write what you want to write. Be important to the people you live around. He came by. He got his form filled out. They got a house. <laughs> so I didn't go I didn't go to writing, I didn't get, you know, the MFA line of understanding of this is how you do this, but I got something real important about how you do this. And so I tell that story as often as I can because the world will tell you who you are supposed to be. But there are 10,000 people around you up close who will tell you who you are. And if you can access that as an artist, as a writer, as a teacher, as an administrator, as anybody, you have something that no one can ever take from you. And that's what I did. I went home that night. I couldn't go to sleep. I was worried because of how I first thought that scene should happen. You know, I should be protective and run this guy off and, and you know, she don't have time for you. Or, you know. And then I really... And, it, and she used to do things in the moment with the intention of that lesson. She knew, she, she was doing it because she was being herself, but she also was watching me. I was in her side eye. She knew that I liked, I, I, that I had a passion for writing, so she wanted to cultivate something. And the second moment that she did that was in workshop. When she, anybody else might have thought she had embarrassed me. She said, oh, Nikki Finney, you write real pretty. You write real pretty. <laughs> she did a sigh like that, like. She said, so what? So you write so pretty. 
It's got to do more than that. It's got to do more than that. So what's, what, what's next? What's the next level? And I, and I sat there and I was like, I didn't know what to say because I had fallen in love with my, my way I wrote things. And I went home and I said, oh, I want my words to be more than adornments. I want them to do more than adorn the page. I want them to buy somebody a house. Send somebody to get her PhD. <laughs> Come back home. Be present. Be accountable in a way that you won't get that from a course, you know? And so she gave me so much. And so I call her name all the time because I did call her before. She was in the hospice. She was in hospice and she was dying of cancer. And I said, you know, I said, I thought it was a silly question. Like, what can I send you? I had just seen her. And she said, send me some paper and some of them fat pens. <laughs> okay. So I sent her a box of paper, as much paper as the box would hold, and as many fat pens as I could find, and also put in a fedora because she loved hats. And then she died about a month later. So you said something about breath and about breath not being the end. And, and we were talking at the beginning about, you're talking about breath. Julia was talking about breath. I was holding my grandmother's hand when she was 100 and dying of cancer. And my mother, she wouldn't want me to tell you this story, but she was afraid because her mother was dying. And that was a natural sort of, and you know, they say the granddaughter comes through the grandmother and not the mother. I believe that wholeheartedly. But my grandmother was dying, and she was 100 years old, and she was in her house. And she had told us three months before, she had told me, she'd come up to me, and she'd put her little finger, she's about this tall. And she said, you are the oldest granddaughter. It's your responsibility to take care of me. And she walked off. Poof. So I took care of her. So she stayed at home. And so I drove up and down the highway from Kentucky to South Carolina until it was June and I moved in with her from June to August. And she died in October. And my mother, and of course, mothers and daughters have this combative relationship. I have a combative relationship with my mother, but my mother saw me taking care of my mother and then she stepped in in August and said, I can get it from here. I got this. And I went back to teaching and then she lived another month and then I drove down on a Friday. My mother met me at the screen door and she said, she's been waiting for you all day. And she hadn't said a word from at three o'clock and it, I got there at six and she couldn't speak anymore and hospice had left. You know, they give you this blue book that tells you everything that happens to the minute. And I held her hand from six to nine and she died at 9.06. But I'm trying to tell you about the breath leaving her body went into me. And so I, I tell that story because we are taught to fear death in the Western way. But I got so much from just her legs were trying to run, her feet. I mean, yeah, her feet were trying to run, her arms. She was just not, she couldn't speak. And she was, I was like, it's okay. We, it's all right. We got this. And then she died, and there was this, that last little, what they call that, that, the rattle. But I was holding her hands, and so it became not a, a death rattle gone, but a death rattle that entered me that I'm so happy to walk this earth with. No one taught me that. No one told me that's what I was supposed to feel. But because I was so in contact with my grandmother and because I trust my belly over my mind most days, I knew this was special. Mm. Yeah, the first poem I ever heard you read, it was at the Karis anniversary, Hurricane. Oh, Hurricane Beulah. Beulah. Yeah. And I'm the oldest granddaughter. Uh -huh. And that was the moment I knew I was like, okay, pay attention, <laughs> <laughs> pay attention. And I haven't stopped paying attention. And as you know, I do my research. Yes, you do. Beautiful research. <laughs> I mean, research on you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Which is beautiful research to do. Um, 
because you have you have written letters mm. to black women writers all over the world and I go to the archive and I see a letter from Nikki Finney letter from Nikki Finney but then I found out they didn't tell you that no they Alexa <laughs> was in Boston in the June Jordan archives and June and I had been friends in California and we were writing and this is how people get in your business too you know like and so some, June died and all of her stuff of course goes to the archives and Alexa says yes I'm sitting here reading your letter to June I was like what did I say? What? It was okay though. <laughs> right, which is which is another issue around the archive because there is a distinction between personal and professional correspondence right. that does not stand up to a letter from Nikki Finney to another writer. So, um, so I I didn't know I was going to be. I thought you must have given permission, but we're not going to talk about what's in those letters. No. I actually was going to ask you about an aspect of your work that I learned about after I had known you, which is with the National Black Women's Health Project, now the National Black Women's Health Imperative, crucial organization founded by Billy Avery, and actually the first people to ever pay me to facilitate anything. I think I was 15, and they paid me to facilitate a workshop for their youth summer program, and I was like, you can get paid to do this. <laughs> okay, so now we really share another story. Yes. I moved from Alabama to Atlanta, needed a job. Billy Avery ran, heard about the National Black Women's Health Project. I had my little camera because I was a pseudo neophyte photographer and started working. She, she gave me a typewriter and a desk and said, we need a, a newsletter, we need photographs. I'm going to pay you this much. This will be enough for your rent. And I'll say, cool, that's fine. I'll do it. And she hired me. And when someone hires you like that, 24, 25 years old, and says they believe in what and who you are, and you're like stumbling trying to make sure you are who you say you are, it's permission. It's guidance. It's just it's invaluable. And within a year, it was the end of decade of women's conference in Nairobi, Kenya. And she said, you're going to Kenya. I was like, I don't have any money. She said, well, you're going to go and you're going to cover the conference. And so I did. I went to Kenya. I took a camera, uh, interviewed people, stayed a week. It was my first trip out of country. Billy Avery and the National uh, Black Women's Health Project did that. And I still have some of those uh, newsletters. I, I uh, did an article on Audre Lorde before she died. Um, interviewed people who were just coming through what they call the mother house, which is an old Victorian house um, right downtown Atlanta. And it was just the thing that I came away with, everything that I have ever done in my life, especially in my, in my 20s, was some sort of like uh, piece of the collage. And these were black women who were teaching me the word empowerment. Billy said, no, you're going to hear Sweet Honey in the Rock. Who's Sweet Honey in the Rock? Let's go. And we would just go. And there would be Bernice singing. And it was just an amazing time to be um, trying to, to be a writer and to find myself and to see empowered black women out doing their work in the world about this, about health. Workshops at home, how to uh, exercise at home, what to eat. You know, I became a vegetarian in that, in, you know, during those days, or pescatarian some days. But, because, um, you know, fried fish, what can I say? <laughs> I am from South Carolina. So, so that, yes, that, that practice of black women offering their breath. Yes to younger black women and to whole communities yep. by saying, I believe you can do things that we don't know that we can do those things. Right. So thank you. And so I wanted to transition because I know you all have questions. So glad you each decided to be here. I already know you're brilliant because you are here right now of all the places you could possibly be, which was the right choice. And so you have to ask me a question because I stood up there for I don't know how long and read something that I don't know that you got anything from. 
I mean, you stood up, which was very, but you know what I mean? Like, I don't mean like you didn't get anything, but like, what did you get? Like, what did you hear? Like this, this was about, I mean, it's so particular about the conference. I wanted it to, um, this is about art and how you use art and, and, and do art and, and, what, and you know, the world doesn't care for the most part about that, but you do, you're here. And so maybe you heard something that I, I wasn't aware of or I wasn't conscious of, but I you know, am aware of in, in different kinds of ways. So I would love to hear um, what you heard. And I just wanted to give a transition for those folks who are usually not the first person to raise their hand, though I really love the first person who did raise their hand already, um, which comes from the Black Feminist Breathing Chorus, which is, which is a, um, an ancestral reverence, breath transferal project. And one of the ancestors that it honors is Tony Cade Bambara. And so the phrase that we use from Tony Cade Bambara, there are so many we could use, comes from an interview, a conversation she had with um, Kalamu Salam, And they're talking about revolution, of course. And he asked, do you think that fiction is the most effective way to do it? And she said, you all may have seen this, it's in the preface of this bridge called my back. She said, the most effective way to do it is to do it. So we're gonna repeat that in unison as a community, those of you who are afraid to say your question, just, just do it, right? Tony Cape and is giving you permission like she's given us permission through you. So we can take another deep breath, inhaling and exhaling. And here we go. The most effective way to do it is, is to, to do, do it. it. The most effective way, way to do it is to do it. it. The most effective way to do it is to do it. I can't hear you all enough, so I'm gonna keep repeating it until I hear, I can he hear like a full, this is a, this is a space of worship, right? Of like black folks who had no sacred space, who came here and believed in a form of freedom that they had never seen. So that's where you're sitting. So act like you know, ready? The most effective way to do it is to do it. The most effective way to do it is to do it. The most effective way to do it is to do it. All right, all right. Okay. Do you still have a question or you, your question changed? In the, okay. <laughs> So you said, I trust my belly more than my head most days. Could you say more if there's more to say? It says so much already. But. My grandmother was a farmer. And she would walk out into, you know, under her pine trees, and she would talk to her God, or she would find some tea. and. I saw her make decisions based on her belly. She didn't tam tell me that, but she would say, it doesn't feel right. I'm not doing that right now. We're gonna go do this. And why, my brothers heard the same grandmother say the same things. They have no memory of this, zero. But we were, we must have been in tune in a different kind of way. And she would say, you know, I know you love those books. You carry them everywhere. You come to my house, you got 20 books under your arm. You sit up all night, you're in front of the fan, you take, take them out to the porch. She said, but don't forget, you already know a lot. And I would say, no, I don't, you know, I doubt it. So the belly for me is like, not, opposite of the head, it just works hand in hand because I love the head too. I love intelligence of that. But I am, I am, I am, my mother used to call me her sensitive child. Because I would feel everything, you know? And I, my life is about, 
I could tell you some things that I feel before I know. That's, that's what I'm talking about. And I think trusting yourself in that way more and more and, and, and coupling that with action. I mean, I, I couldn't have talked, I, I didn't know how to talk about this when I was 20 or even 30. But as I got older, I really saw things happening to people around me, people I loved, who might say how they felt and then they would do something, just the opposite. And I would say, why'd you do that? You just told me two minutes ago that you felt that if you got in that car, something bad was gonna happen. And so I, I, those moments are, for me are learning lessons. I, 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 I imbibe those, I take those in as, as things I wanna remember. And so, I don't know if that's, if that, yes? Okay. Yeah, we have, we have you right here. Um, I don't really have a question. And my bad, I've never even heard of you before. Um, but I will say. We're so glad you're here. Okay. But I will say in the past eight months, I've had seven loved ones die. So when I walked in here, I walked in here with a heavy weight of grief. And when you talked about the breath and how that transitions and the way you described those colors, that was like commanding my attention. I just want to say thank you because right now, I don't feel that heavy weight of grief. So I am very glad that I came so and I knew I was supposed to be here. So it's a pleasure meeting you. Nice to meet you too. Absolutely. But you know, that's the power of what you're doing here this weekend has everything to do with what she just said, I think. I mean, you, you're talking about creating, you know, now is the time to be so creative you know, cut the TV off, get 45 out of your head, and do, you know, manifest breath and voice. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm writing in a way that I don't even, like, I don't even know what to call it. You know, I, I expect to get thrown out of really nice places in the next 12 months. <laughs> but... But I think you have, this is the time right now to not, um, and I was, you know, I was raised a polite, kind child from South Carolina. And, you know, politeness is, the volley will tell you, we, we understood, we were raised in that this is how you do this and this is not how you do this. And we had to, like, fight our way out of that, you know, as we found the thing that we love in our lives. And able to say what we need to say, somebody else will find it. Somebody else will hear it, and now you have to take it someplace else. That's why I wanted to come and be a part of this, because that's, that's where change happens. I mean, if Tony Cade had not said what she said in that moment on that street, and the right person li was listening, because it could have been another person who did the thing that I was thinking about doing. But I think she saw me. I think she knew she was trying to bring something out of me. And so... I'm so glad you said what you said, and I'm so glad you asked that question. And yes, you. <laughs> I grew up in Columbia, and I had friends that went to Spring Valley High School. I live five minutes away from Forest Lake Country Club. I watched the flag come down. I drove past the Strom Thurmond Wellness Center. I went to high school with those frat boys. Um, and I, I want, you, you talk about being an artist of your time, um, but as a woman from Columbia, South Carolina, or from South Carolina, do you have any advice for me being an artist of, of my time? Well, first of all, we're gonna have to be in touch. Because it, it, I can't give you everything that I would love to give you right now. But I think you have to really trust that I'm not just saying that I'm an artist of my time. You're an artist. If you want to be an artist of your time, you have to look around. 
and you have to see the things that matter to you, the things that need changing, and you have to write into that win. You can't, and 19 is such a great age. It was when I just really started pulling away from uh, some of those forces and, and, and factors that wanted me to be this when I wanted to go a different direction. So you are incredibly surrounded, it seems, by people who can offer you uh, parts of the collage you will need for the rest of your life. There is not one answer. The, 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 the right thing really to tell you right now is to pay attention, listen to your belly, Try to find out where your genius resides, because we all have that. We just have to figure out where it is. Why are you studying what you're studying? What you would like to do with that? Um, those kind of questions. You're at the perfect moment of your life to sort of, I know you're already asking yourself that. So we, will, we should talk more. I mean, come on, this is crazy. I'm glad you said hello, but... Um, yeah, let's keep, let's have some conversations about that, okay? Yeah, Lamont. Um, thank you for coming out this evening. Uh, my name is Lamont Lily. I'm a local journalist and activist and poet myself. And um, I've been knee deep in the struggle for black lives and uh, marginalized and poor people um, for the last um, about four or five years. That's my life every day. And I wake up and I find myself in a constant state, as James Baldwin would say, a constant state of rage or just fucking pain. And I was sitting on my seat sweating bullets because every word you said, I felt it. And I somewhat live it. How do you how do we uh, walk in this state, yet continue to create, yet continue to be whole human beings, yet continue to walk in sunlight? I know we've been doing it as a people, but as our youth see videos of our people <laughs> slaughtered in the streets, how do we eat that and still remain healthy as a people? I'll leave it at that. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being here. Thank you. You can't just eat that. You know? You say four or five years every day, this is what you've been doing. You can't just do that. You got to do something else because something ha as stuff is taken from you, you have to replenish. It's, it's the human body. It's the human spirit. So if you don't turn away from that for a minute and go and do something that you need to replenish yourself, not somebody else, but yourself, you got to figure that out. Because we lose people every day who don't go and replenish. The Volia was at USC last week and somebody stood up and asked her, how do you, when you read this book, and this is what I meant by I'm strapped in, I can't move, I can't kill nobody, I'm just, I'm just reading by my window, the sunlight is coming in. How do you keep writing about this? Book after book after book, life after life after life, March after March after March, how do you keep doing that? She said, it's hard. I know it's hard. It's always been hard. It's always going to be hard. And I say that to you as well. But there's another thing you add to the hardness. We're human beings. We have to laugh. We have to ease up, take the foot off our neck, go for a walk in the woods, do whatever. I, I have to go to... Pine trees, I walk in the pine trees. I don't need anybody else with me. I know I will be replenished. It won't change anything when I come out of the pine trees. But I know I will breathe, I will find, you're not even breathing right there. You, you got your arms folded, 
I want to come and hug you, but I can't get, I will hug you after. But I'm just saying, there's a smile. We are, we are, we are warriors and fighters, but we are human beings. And you have to fit, you have to replenish that. We're not machines. None of us. Our children, if you see them, if I see them looking at the same thing over and over and over again, I shut it off. I have reached the age where I do things that I could get hurt. I might get hurt. But I just have to say, this was, you can't do this anymore. You got to come sit with me and I got to take some time and we have to talk about this. So I got to show you this. Let me show you this. I don't want to see that. That's boring. Look at it anyway. Don't move. So I understand what you're saying. And as a community, whoever knows you needs to put their hand on you, needs to see you, needs to come and make sure you're okay. That's what communities do. That's why we must have community. Because somebody needs to take your place sometimes and give you a minute off so you can come back strong. Danielle? Okay. Um, I was trying to formulate this question, um, so bear with me. Um, so a lot of us um, were actually here last night um, for a uh, candidates forum um, for the new city council, which we'll elect this fall, and the new mayor, um, because our incumbent mayor um, is stepping down. And I know that um, your father was Chief Justice of South Carolina. I know that you've spent a lot of time probably thinking about the law. Um, and we had some folks on the stage, um, you know, I've been in the streets some with Lamont, um, some with some other organizers here. Um, we have been working on um, sort of dreaming up um, a Durham beyond policing. Um, and we have been, we were in this space last night and trying to grapple with and ask questions about the law. And as you probably know, the Confederate statue at the old Durham County Courthouse came down um, August 14th. And um, and we've um, since been dealing with uh, the folks who were even just around, right, that statue being charged with felonies. Um, and people, you know, people who are family members, people who are, you know, pillars of this community saying, you have broken the law, right? You can't just circumvent the law. And people who are on the stage, all but one of the, um, the mayoral candidates, um, is, is black, is African American, right? And only one, right, has really talked about or is thinking about dreaming up something beyond policing. Um, and I'm wondering, I'm wondering because, I'm sorry, this is long, but the, but the conversation you're having about um, relying, right, on um, our bellies, right, on our instinct. Um, that for me, I studied law like um, was really kind of the only thing for me that kind of got me out of this mindset that, oh, this is the law, and this is what we should follow, right? To like, this is the law, and this is profoundly unhealthy and violent for us. Um, and as, you know, this is a health humanities and social justice conference, um, can you say a little bit about, you know, someone growing up learning about the law, hearing about the law, Many people, um, you know, break the law in the name of social justice. Um, like, what does it mean? Like, what is that, um, what is, yeah, do you have thoughts about that, right? There's people in the audience, I mean, somebody said something incredibly homophobic and transphobic last night. And like, nobody got up and was just like, no, right? Yeah. Like, you know, but people are, and I, and I kind of felt like people were just here, mm -hmm. right? And people were not responding in a way Right, that like, and people knew that it was wrong. People were writing on Facebook about it, right? But nobody in that moment stood up like Takiya Thompson stood up, right? Mm -hmm. Like Bree Newsom stood up and was like, no, this is wrong, right? So I don't know what the humanities can, and I, I think the humanities has everything to do with this kind of thing, but I wanted to raise that question um, since we were, a lot of us were in this space last night and like feeling, yeah, we're in a, we're in a, we're in a time here in Durham, so. 
wow, that's a, you know, I grew up in a household where the law was talked about all the time. And I didn't feel the same way my father and my brothers felt about it. And my understanding and my education about how I felt had everything to do with the time that I grew up. I mean, I was born in 57, so the 60s were my melting pot when I really acquired all of my understanding about the world. And I'm in South Carolina, and there's Majeska Simpkins, and there are freedom fighters, and there's you know all of this happening in the air around me. Why was I interested in that and my brothers not so much? I don't know. One child is different from another. But the thing about the two, I have two reactions to what you're asking about the humanities. The reason Lamont is tired is because the same people are on the front lines all the time. They get sent to jail, they get hurt, they have to stand up and say, excuse me, that's a very homophobic comment you just made. And you get tired of that. And so there are many other people in this audience who have never done that. And so what I really want to say is don't just come to this conference to learn something amazingly intellectual while you are here. Don't just occupy the seat. Do something that my grandmother used to say. If you do what you've always done, you're going to get what you've always gotten. Life is short. Raise your hand if you're the PTA president or a city councilman or a reverend, or somebody who doesn't typically raise their hand and say, I'm sorry, that's a very homophobic thing you just said, and I would like to acknowledge it, and maybe we could say it in a different kind of way. Because that's what a community does. Why else are you here? Why else do we come together from different communities in order to offer something that we all need, which is a better community? But if the same people are on the front lines being charged with felony, assault, or whatever, it really matters that somebody new steps up. Last week, back to Thavolia. Thavolia was in town, and the president of Univ the University of South Carolina said in front of God and everybody, well, we're going to have to talk about these monuments at the university in, in Columbia and at the University of South Carolina. And I swear I looked at him to see if I was seeing what I thought I was seeing. I said, well, maybe Thavolia did it. Maybe she inspired him. But we, we have it now. It's out in the air. And we need college presidents and high school presidents and high school teachers to put their foot, toe, something across the line in a new way. Don't whisper it to me when I leave and say, I'm on your side. I don't need that. That's not helpful. We need skin in the game. Or it's just an intellectual exercise. And that's what you're asking. That's what you're saying. That's the law. Of course, I was raised, don't break the law. But when I saw Bree Newsom going up that pole in, from North Carolina, in South Carolina, somebody in my family said, she, she crossed the line. She shouldn't be in South Carolina doing that. This is not her state. I said, no, she should have done it. She should have done exactly what she did because nobody else had the courage to do it. And she caught a whole bunch of flack in, in all kinds of ways. She was arrested. She, you know, all of that. But in the end, what happened? <laughs> it takes risk. But you have to ask your belly if what you are doing is correct. Even though your head knows you're going to jail. Or you might go to jail. But there's a lot of good people who've been to jail. longer answer to that really important question, but other people have to step up. Other good people, good and quiet people who have a lot that they're thinking about, but they're too comfortable. 
And we need to be less comfortable. The only way this is going to change ever is if we put something on the line. So I have to say before I call on somebody else, I do not know what time it is. I have not known what time it is any point in this evening. I didn't even know to come to the event except for that the other people at the hotel were leaving. I almost didn't bring Nikki to the event on time. So three minutes? We have three minutes. Okay, so that sounds like time for one more concise question. Uh oh, pressure. <laughs> not a haiku, but you know, just concise. <laughs> Uh, uh, thank you so much for um, everything today, um, this evening. I wanted to uh, ask you to talk a little bit about a phrase that I th think I heard correctly in your talk about um, the intrusion of metaphor um, and I guess the relationship between the visual and the poetic in your work, the mural, um, why that was the right medium uh, for to communicate what it is that you were trying to do, um, yeah. I, I I'm a I love metaphor. I'm a poet and a writer and a person who loves metaphor. And I have also been accused of mixing my metaphors, <laughs> which I don't really care if you accuse me of that. It was on purpose. Um, so the visual and the word, I, you know, they work hand in hand. And if they're given equal power and weight, they are amazing. And I ha actually happen to love murals, and I love the, the, the muralists I mentioned. Um, and I think, I mean, this is a time where we have to, I was walking today and I passed an amazing mural of, uh, it was right off Main Street of the, um, maybe, civil, maybe civil rights. Um, of Polly Murray. Just amazing, and I just stopped in my tracks and, what if we took kids to that? And what if we um, you talked about it more? I mean, this is why we're here. It's like, how can we be more active artistically in our communities? Not subtly, but straight in the eye, strategic. Um, and sometimes, you know, because I love, I, I would not be a poet, I would not be a writer if I was not in love with the visual. If I write something, I want you to see it. So when you said about the colors or the person who said that thing, that, I was like, okay, I, I ch check that off. I do not want to just write pretty. I want you to see what I'm talking about. I want it to matter. I want you to go home with it in your pocket. I want you to fall asleep with, just before you fall asleep, think about something I said. Not because I'm, my ego needs that but because I believe in the power of words and I believe that images and visuals and art changes us. And we need it now more than ever. We need to be making it. We need to be talking it up. We need to be setting it out on easels and on the street. We need to be taking our children to talk about it, asking them to make it, cherishing the fact that they are creative agents in the world. And so, the metaphor thing, I can always, to me, I'm a, I used to, uh, I, I did used to sketch and, and, and draw, and I was always more direct in my drawing than I was in my writing. And I think that has changed, or hopefully that has changed, um, even though um, I use metaphor now so that you can see what I'm talking about. So it's kind of a simple answer to a good question. So we've been invited to transform our relationship to our breathing, and we have in here. I want to honor the bravery of the people who spoke and who spoke their questions and who spoke in pursuit of their own healing and who brought their children to this space. I want to honor the bravery that's in this room as yet unexpressed. And so if we can just close in unison with what you know Tony Cade Bambara said, and let us remember this moment of breathing together as activation, as bravery, as what gives us that breath to say, uh-uh, no, nobody's going to be transphobic in sacred space tonight and not hear about it, right? We're going to use that breath. Can I say one thing? Please say anything. 
exercise. I use this Tony K. Bambara phrase in my life. I'm sitting at my desk. I want to go get some tea. I want to go like go for a walk. I want to go see something else because the writing is hard and I don't know how to get to the thing that I'm supposed to be getting to. And, I, and she comes into my head every single time. There is no other way to get this done except to do it. It's not complicated. It's not adorned. Sit your butt in the chair and don't get up until it's finished. It, we're not doing something that I'm, t I wanted to say this because you can use this if you so choose. It's a mantra, but you, it's, I've been using it for 30 years and it works. All right, so the most effective way to do it is to do it. One more time. The most effective way to do it is to do it. Thank you all so much for being here. We're going to stay up here. So if folks want to um, get Nikki Finney's book, my book is also out there. We're going to use this table so folks can line up by these steps. I think I was supposed to tell you that's where to line up. Thank you so much for coming. It yes, really matters. Yes, yes, Thank you yes. so much.